So one of the biggest reasons ozempic babies can be happening is possibly just because people don't realize that they are. You've just tuned into Rebel Wellness Podcast, your resource for realigning and revitalizing your health and well-being. I'm your host, Kaylee, also known as Coach Kales. I'm a holistic health educator, certified nutritionist, and fitness professional of nearly a decade. I'm stoked to have you with us. You just joined a community of amazing souls who are ready to break free from the confines of the often outdated and confusing health advice all around us. Living in a world overwhelmed by quick fix diets and unrealistic beauty and body standards, us rebels stand for change. If you're like me, you're exhausted with the confusion and polarization plaguing the social media health scene. My mission is to empower you to step beyond today's diet culture, adopt a holistic health approach paired with the foundations of science for lasting, well-rounded wellness. Through teaching you how to tune in and embrace your mind, body, and soul, we'll reject one-size-fits-all solutions, realigning you on a better path that honors your unique needs and values. With new episodes weekly, this podcast is your sanctuary for deep wellness exploration, featuring expert advice, real-life stories, and a true commitment to your growth. Your journey to better health and simplicity in life begins now. Let's jump right in. Hello, Rebel Soul. Welcome back to the actual beginning of one of my most favorite and highly favorited by our listeners series, Hot Take Summer, where I spend some time discussing my hot take on a variety of the current popular trends, health fads, and more. So if you have some things that you've been hearing all over health talk or Instagram or any of that stuff regarding health and wellness that you want to hear my hot take on, submit anything to DM at Rebel Wellness Podcast or at Kaylee Loren. You can find my social media in the show notes, and that'll be a great way for you to potentially hear my thoughts and research on these topics and each episode of Hot Take Summer. And this has been, the today's topic has been a very highly requested and just, it's a very buzzy discussion going on in the fertility world, especially, but just on social media in general, because Ozempic and I mean, like I've said before in previous episodes, Ozempic has kind of become the name for semaglutides or terzepatides, you know, GLP-1 receptor agonists. It's a medication type, it's a peptide, you know, you'll hear a ton of different names just basically talking about the same thing. But the most common name you'll hear people just call it, even if it's not that brand, is Ozempic. Ozempic is a brand name. It's almost like how we call all Ziplocs Ziploc, even if they're not the Ziploc brand. (laughs) So think about that. Like if I say it, I mean, I'm going to try in this discussion to just refer to it as GLP-1. So if you hear me say GLP-1, all that means is Ozempic, okay? All that means is semaglutide, you know, terzepatides are a little bit different, but they work as peptide agonists in your body, which if you don't know what that is, essentially they communicate to the hormones in your stomach and such to mobilize and utilize fat or to reduce food noise, quote unquote, to make you not as hungry as long or hungry at all for some people. I have had several clients under the care of their doctors go on semaglutides, GLP-1s. And so I've kind of seen and researched as much as humanly possible to make sure that everything is executed safely and healthfully. And I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I've tried to share a lot of that with you guys as things develop, since this is a relatively new medication for the general population. It's not a new, new (laughs) that it's like only a year old or something like that, but it's only been really expensive. Uh, available rather for the general population for the last two, three years. Initially, it was mostly kind of dominated for diabetics only. Um, And even before that, it was still just in research trials and such. So unfortunately, we don't have like 10 year scope of understanding what these medications will do for us. However, what we do know is what we have researched now in people's real life experiences. And I always love a blend of the research and the science plus the real life on the ground experiences 
that people have because that is where science fails a little as far as research goes is it doesn't really take into account how the individual unique body reacts and everybody's body is unique. So it's not quite as straightforward as, oh, well, we did a research study on 200 people and this is what the common denominator was of the results. And then you get that other person, you know, who lives in a different state who had a whole different like exposure, genetics, whatever, and it didn't work for them or maybe it killed them, you know, (laughs) like there's a lot of reasons why blending the two is super important. So I'm always going to try to bring that perspective here for you guys. And I know so many of you have shared some great feedback where you really appreciate my approach. So I would assume that if you are new to Rebel Wellness, (laughs) hello, welcome to the show. This is a really kind of funny, fun, funny, I'm not sure, (laughs) it's a little bit funny, but great place to start in the beginning of Hot Take Summer. And today's topic is really interesting. If you don't know about it already, this is something that is kind of worth knowing, you know, so I hope that you enjoy this entire episode. What I try my best to do with Hot Take Summer is keep them a little bit more bite-sized. However, as a lot of you guys know, it doesn't always stay that bite-sized, but we will do our best to make sure that we don't dive too deep into the ins and outs in science because I want to keep it digestible for you and straight to the point as much as possible. Possible. But like I said, today's topic is regarding what is being called right now in the fertility world and media as Ozempic babies. We'll get into that a little bit more here in a moment. But if you are interested in learning more about Ozempic, I give a whole deep dive from this time last summer of what we knew and what we know about semaglutides, GLP ones, on episode 23. So pop over back to that episode if you want a pretty up-to-date overview of everything you may want to understand regarding GLP-1 medications. And I have updated ones as well from this year, episode 62 and episode 66. 62 is a lot more of kind of like what have we found out a little bit more about the medication? What are some you know concerns to be aware of as well as 66 is a really kind of heart-to-heart deep conversation about who I think could be a good candidate for utilizing a GLP-1 medication for body composition aid. And so that is a really, that's a very different tone. I would say if you're somebody who's always been on the fence and you've struggled with a high body fat percentage for a large majority of your life, you want to get your health better in check. Maybe you are trying to get fertile. Maybe that's why you clicked on this episode. I think that that would be a really great conversation that you should definitely tune into and hold a little bit of space for yourself with that one because that that is a deep conversation, but it's gotten some really fantastic feedback as well. So I'm so grateful that people have been giving me some thanks in the DMs about that episode that it really hit the nail on the head for stuff socially that they were struggling with, with deciding whether or not they should take a GLP-1 or not. But with that said, again, I would welcome you to come join our social media community um, at Kaylee Loren on Instagram or at Rebel Wellness Podcast. That's where you're going to get so many great more in-depth nutrition, fitness, and just overall health mindset resources. And I will say, if you sign up right now while listening to this episode, you should be just in time for our June newsletter, unless it's the end of June now when you're listening to this, or another month post-June in 2024. But um wherever you're at, I would definitely recommend you come join uh, the wellness newsletter on my website, coachkales.com. That's going to be a really great resource for you one time a month to hear about all the episodes that either were just launched with good topics that you don't want to miss and a variety of other resources such as wellness journal prompts and clean beauty advice or products that I love to use um, and a a whole bunch of other things. There's so many great little things that I mix into those newsletters. It's not spammy at all and it's completely free. So definitely recommend you join my newsletter on my website. All right. So before we dive into this topic today, I do just want to remind you that it's not medical advice. So this is just a health discussion. And should you have further questions or things that you want to apply to yourself in your health, you should absolutely run it through your primary care physician or any practitioner that you professionally work with before moving forward with any sort of specific medications, including GLP-1s. So today's discussion should not be taken for medical advice. It should 
just be a conversation to open your mind a little bit more to what has been going on and with alternate health side effects that can come with medications like these because these are very powerful medications they are changing people's lives for good or for bad you know it's kind of it's it's mostly for good honestly from what i've seen and everybody will know that i'm typically a very skeptical person when it comes to you know, miracle drugs and such. But it is a pretty fascinating medication, I will say. And even though I may not be the type of person to immediately tell every single one of my clients struggling with a body fat percentage that is excessively high to immediately go on them, I'm totally not going to be that person ever. However, I do think in conjunction with the lifestyle changes that I instill in my clients and people I work with or help that this can be one of the most powerful medications for helping with the unique side to existing in a body fat percentage that's above, let's say 35% for an extended period of time, because there is a lot of metabolic disorder and dysfunction rather that we are starting to better understand a little bit more especially as you know science starts to pay attention to female bodies a little bit more and they realize that the reason why they have never really included females in a lot of scientific studies historically is because we are a curveball our body can do so much more than the male body in a whole lot of different ways, including the fact that we cycle monthly, where we have very significant swings of very stimulating hormones, our sex hormones, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, luteinizing hormone, follicular stimulating hormone. There's a lot of hormones in play that male bodies either don't have at all or don't have at ratios the way ours do. And therefore, we can be kind of a statistical outlier because we have too many variables that can go in, if that makes sense. So it makes sense why we haven't been studied in group situations very much. However, it doesn't make sense that they haven't spent enough time studying us for women's health, um, you know, outside of obvious, annoying, patriarchal health (laughs) situations. But overall, it is really important to know that we are getting better quality women's health care and research. So we are starting to learn a lot more now than we ever did before, which is really exciting. However, it is still slow to come to fruition. So as we discuss these things, I think it's great to remember that there is some cool stuff on its way. We are understanding things a lot more, but it is also still not perfect. And science is always trying to challenge its previous hypothesis or theory result, et cetera. And therefore, we are always adjusting what was then the fact and what it is now. So there's probably, you know, I, I bring that up because it is important to know that, you know, a lot of people don't really talk about the fact that, yes, yeah, science will debunk itself at some point. You know, we get a better microscope, we get better methods and technology in general to better understand gut health, you know, like that's why we have improvements in understanding gut health more and more and more and changing our opinions and understanding, like we're changing a lot of our understanding about cholesterol, for example, and we're seeing it from a whole different perspective. And if you don't know that cholesterol has been demonized, you know, by the food world, and it's actually an extremely important necessary hormone for our body because cholesterol creates most of our sex hormones. So if you don't have enough of it, you actually no longer produce enough of those hormones for healthy vitality. And so we've always been taking medications and we've always been, you know, forcing, looking into how do you keep your cholesterol down. However, we're better understanding now that maybe actually there are genetic nuances to each different body and different ranges of cholesterol is actually completely healthy and it could look really high on the standard Western medicine scale, but it can be completely healthy for that person. So that's just a little random sidebar, but that's that's an example of how we are constantly learning and changing in health. And so anything you probably learned about health from your grandma or your mom when you were really little is probably wrong now. Like fat is not bad for you, you know, um, because we know now that like there's nuance, there's a whole other different side to it, you know, and it's not one size fits all. So With all that said, let's jump into this conversation about Ozempic babies because there's a lot of different discussions online and I think a lot of people are just trying to make sense of it. So I took a lot of different people's 
takes on it and ran it through the filter of comparing to science on PubMed and all that stuff and put it together to what I think are the most important theories that some of them have actually been proven. And I've actually seen this happen for some of my PCOS clients who went on GLP-1s and now have babies. (laughs) So I take a little bit of a different perspective and approach, which is really, I think, kind of cool. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation today. And at the end, I actually answer a really popular question that I was asked by one of our listeners about GLP-1 medications. So stay tuned all the way to the end to hear that question, because I'm sure it's one that you have been possibly wondering yourself. So let's go. So I think if you haven't observed it or experienced it yet, it is important to understand that nowadays infertility or struggles with fertility in general is extremely common. It's one of the biggest challenges faced by a lot of premenopausal females today. And especially since a lot of us are having children later in life, we are noticing that when we are finally ready to have children our own in our own bodies, um, we are not fertile or we're struggling with fertility. You know, maybe you come around to the age 35, 36 or so, and you're just your follicles, your ovarian reserves, you know, the environment in your uterus is not best for growing a baby. You know, um, that's essentially what infertility is, is there's something not operating properly in your daily, I mean, your monthly cycle that is putting your body in a position where it's just not welcoming to sperm. And the other side of the equation that I really, really, really want to nail in for you is your male partner can absolutely be to blame for infertility if you're struggling to get pregnant. It is really important to understand that. We have infertility on both sides of females and males um, in the uh, conception equation there (laughs) that sperm needs to be healthy as well. And we have really low sperm counts or really unhealthy sperm in general for kind of the same reasons, a lot of the same reasons that females are struggling. You know, there's a lot to do with our environmental factors, our lifestyle. You know, American culture is very fast paced, very, you know, your health takes a backseat to everything else. And there's an extreme environmental toxin loads that our bodies are exposed to every day that absolutely are impairing our fertility. Think phthalates, PFAs, anything that is oxidative to our cells and we're not sleeping well enough or not not drinking, you know, for poisoning ourselves consistently, having a lot of alcohol, you know, there's a lot of these lifestyle things that have become so common to, especially in American culture, you know, I'm based in the US, so I'm speaking from this scope, that we are seeing the downhill effect of not taking good care of ourselves because your fertility is directly correlated to your well-being. It's whether or not you want to have kids, your fertility says a lot about your health. And it's important for us as females to be really in tune with our fertility, understand if we're having healthy cycles or not, or if we are not cycling at all and we're using birth control or fake hormones in general, that they come with consequences as well as far as fertility goes. And again, since fertility equals a lot of our well-being, we should be paying attention to it regardless of if we want children. But for those who do want children, it's very important to know that there are some interesting things going on in the world of GLP-1 medications and how they can impact your body to getting pregnant. And this is why we call them Ozempic babies. They're not babies that uh, essentially happened pregnant and you took Ozempic while being pregnant. That's not what it is. It's you've been trying to get pregnant or maybe you weren't trying to get pregnant, but you just never were um, aware of it until you were taking Ozempic and suddenly your fertility restored or became active again somehow and you got pregnant. So that's what an Ozempic baby is, is you got pregnant in conjunction with use of a GLP-1 medication. So the first thing I'll say too is um, this happened to one of my clients recently and it was really important that you guys know that you should not be staying on your GLP-1 medication during the entire pregnancy because it is not known yet the impacts on your fetus while taking that medication while growing your fetus. (laughs) So it is important to know that you should stop that medication use. That is what the literature says. That is what doctors will say for now because they don't understand how it could impact or impair the development of your child during the pregnancy. So if if you were, if you've been on it and you took your medication and you unexpectedly got pregnant, but you found out maybe six or eight weeks later 
through pregnancy and you're like, oh my gosh, but I've been taking my medication every week during that, that's okay usually, but just make sure that you stop usage once you know you're pregnant and, you know, move forward with your practitioner. I want to make sure that that is said because that is important caveat that some people may be wondering, but it is still currently medically recommended that you stop taking the medication while while you are pregnant. Okay, so let's knock the first like science-backed theory out of the park because it is a common one, but it's not entirely the biggest picture of the interesting side to ozempic babies and why they're happening for people who have maybe been trying for a long time and never getting pregnant or females that are struggling with PCOS. So we're going to talk about that next. But first, the the main one to understand is if you're somebody taking birth control and you've started a GLP-1 medication, your stomach, your digestion slows down. That's how a lot of the hunger management and calorie restriction works and how it tells your body to start going into your fat stores. So that's one of the ways that the peptide communicates, okay? You taking any type of medication, you know, and your practitioner should have warned you about this or told you or checked, but if they didn't, then, you know, and that happens way more, unfortunately, than it should <laughs> right now. If you were not told already, your birth control will, its efficacy will be lessened because you're not absorbing as much of it as you normally would with a regular operating digestive system. So by the fact that your digestion slows down, your absorption of the medication will slow down, and therefore your birth control cannot be as strong and it's not going to be as effective as it usually would be because the medication hormones are not getting absorbed by your system at the ratios they're meant to, okay? So it is important to utilize other birth control methods that are non-hormonal during the use of GLP-1 medications because your regular birth control will be slowed down. Along with other medications, I'm not going to go through the list of those, but you should discuss it with your doctor if they didn't tell you already and they put you on one or if you went to a beauty spa or like a med spa and they gave you a GLP-1 medication, you should also reach out to them and see if they have any information available for you so that you could better understand what you should be aware of. And they should have those av resources available for you if they are bothering prescribing and giving out these medications <laughs> because they wouldn't be a very good med spa if they did not have those resources for you. So definitely make sure you check in on that if you are taking specific hormone replacement therapy, or other drugs that impact very important organs on your body, like your brain or your heart, etc. So one of the biggest reasons ozempic babies can be happening is possibly just because people don't realize that their birth control is no longer as effective as it usually would be because their gut is slowing down and absorbing slower. So essentially they are getting pregnant because they're not really on effective birth control anymore because <laughs> the hormones are not in levels that stimulate what blocks pregnancy, okay? So that's something that I saw a really common discussion through a pharmacist who actually had talked about this. And they're like, well, the reason that Ozempic babies are happening are because of this. Yes and no, because there's a lot of people. The main thing that I said we would get into next is that Ozempic babies are happening to people who are trying to get pregnant, so this is the nuance and the interesting part. So it, the people who are on birth control and unexpectedly getting pregnant, that's one thing. So if you're taking a GLP-1 and you're on birth control, use barrier methods to protect yourself from getting pregnant unless you are trying to get pregnant. You know what I mean? But for those of you who are not using birth control and getting pregnant after years and years or months and months of not getting pregnant, usually I would bet that you are struggling with some sort of insulin resistance. And insulin resistance can come from a whole lot of things other than just not eating very well. It can also be eating irregularly. It could be having high stress, like chronic stress long term. There's so many reasons we end up with PCOS. And there are so many of us who are undiagnosed with PCOS. Okay. So it is important that if you have symptoms that are aligned with PCOS, such as, you know, really heavy, painful periods, you know, more body hair than usual, 
belly fat and just boob fat, like fat in your trunk area that is excessive, but the rest of your limbs are not excessively high in body fat. There's a lot of different ways that PCOS shows up for different women. And it's a little bit of kind of a spectrum right now where because we're learning a lot more different types. You don't always have cysts on your ovaries. It actually has a lot more to do with, you know, like the ratios of your androgens to your female sex hormones. So if you're testosterone and DHEA is elevated, but your estrogen and progesterone is not elevated, or it can be sometimes your testosterone, your estrogen is elevated, but your DHEA and your progesterone is not very high. Those are ways that you can kind of tell too that your doctor can do further testing to find out if you have PCOS. But this is where we are typically seeing women with infertility because they do not have enough of the hormones for pregnancy. Progesterone is your pregnancy hormone. (laughs) And so it is the way that your body creates a really happy, healthy environment for your embryo to grow and thrive. So when you go from a normal ovulatory cycle to your egg getting fertilized, you now shift into a progesterone state to take care of that embryo and grow it all the way through pregnancy, okay? So it's really important to know that if you are really low in progesterone, you're not going to have an easy time being fertile. You may struggle with miscarriage or you may just have a challenge with being getting pregnant altogether. That's very, very common. And again, we do know now that PCOS is known as insulin resistance of the ovaries. So it would make sense that as your body is managing blood sugar better through the use of GLP-1 medications, it would greatly support your fertile hormone cycles because it can allow your body to do the ebbs and flows of your sex hormones, the progesterone and estrogen, and all the other hormones involved like your LH, your FSH, you know, what stimulates ovulation and puts your body into a position where once you get into your luteal phase and if there's a fertilized egg and it can hang out in your uterine lining long enough to get further advanced in the embryo phases. (laughs) I'm trying to make that as like listener friendly as possible to understand without having to go through the whole science of it. But that's why your natural cycle being really healthy and longer is important because if your luteal phase is short, that typically correlates, not always, but typically correlates with not enough progesterone. And if you don't have enough time for that fertilized egg to sit in the progesterone state, in your uterine lining, getting all those nutrients, all that stuff and hanging out and developing. If you don't have that amount of time in your cycle, your body's going to start to shed and it will shed all of that with it and you will just continue the cycle of not getting pregnant. And so having healthy amounts of those hormones in a good balance is very key for pregnancy. So when we are seeing insulin resistant patients or females struggles to get pregnant, we often see it because the way that insulin resistance impacts our ovaries and our, therefore our sex hormones is really profound. And it absolutely essentially puts the body into a state where it is in a unhealthy environment to create a long-term healthy pregnancy. Therefore, it's just not going to ovulate and have normal cycles. So unfortunately, that is that is a really common thing as to why people with PCOS, whether it's diagnosed or not, struggle the most is because that insulin resistance is overbearing to the body's natural cycles, okay? So we see this a lot. I see this a ton. I would say nowadays, maybe a fourth of all my female clientele struggle with PCOS. Again, diagnosed or undiagnosed, we usually end up seeing their symptoms and then we go get them tested and sure enough, they get diagnosed. Um, but this isn't a like life sentence. It's not something to be super afraid of. I mean, it's something to be very serious about, but can absolutely work through it. It's very similar to being pre-diabetic or diabetic in general. You can manage it through your lifestyle, including massively changing your nutrition and observing your lifestyle in a way of, is this health promotive? You know, drinking, getting happy hour almost every day of the week or every weekend or whatnot, not very health promotive. And if you're somebody who's looking for more fertility, you're going to have to make different changes in your lifestyle to support that, including cutting out as much as possible with alcohol, you know, Um, also taking good quality supplements after finding out maybe what deficiencies you struggle with, reducing your stressors in your life, delegating things, hiring somebody to clean the house instead of you 
having that on your plate after your long work day. You know, there's a lot of little changes here and there you can make to help your stress and help your insulin resistance through a variety of things because we do get insulin challenges when we have high cortisol all the time. You know, they balance each other in a lot of ways or they support each other in a lot of ways rather. So do know that our lifestyles nowadays in the U.S., especially if you're on the coastal states, is very PCOS supportive in the way that it's supporting you heading towards PCOS, unfortunately. So being aware of that is important, especially if you're somebody who maybe in five years, maybe in two years, maybe in 10 years, you do want to have a child of your own and carry a healthy pregnancy. So being aware that GLP-1 medications can positively affect your hormone cycles through that is one of the biggest ways is through that insulin resistance management. However, also the biggest thing that a lot of people have discussed online is that the getting your body into a healthier body fat percentage, again, because most high body fat percentage is correlated to insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia, which aggravates your hyperandrogenism, again, your testosterone, your DHEAs. So that impairs your early follicle development. So the starting part of your um, ovulatory cycle, it, it will be positive for you to reduce your body fat percentage over time to reduce that insulin resistance and all of that to help you have healthier follicles. So layman's terms, Weight loss can be overall vital importance for individuals who are struggling with anovulatory infertility. And anovulatory infertility tends to happen a lot with, again, high body fat percentage just because of the way that the hormones are imbalanced or high stress, like chronic stress, over, overly stressed lifestyles month to month to month. Those are the biggest things that can both contribute Ultimately, all things kind of land in that insulin resistance category, which is where you're going to have struggles all the way around, okay? It impacts so much with our fertility. So when you are reducing your body fat percentage with a GLP-1 med, a lot of scientists are also saying that that is most likely what is causing all of these ozempic babies is because women are becoming fertile again due to getting into a healthier body fat percentage, you know, which a little bit of that is kind of like a duh. But at the same time, it may not be, you know, that may not be something that um, was ever easy for you to achieve. And it may become easier for you to achieve with one of these medications. So you may be a candidate for that if that is a situation you've been in for a very long time, okay? So again, not medical advice, but that's something to discuss with a practitioner and see if maybe your insurance can help you through that process because like I've said in the other Ozempic episodes, these medications are really expensive. They're outrageously expensive, honestly, and they're probably making Big Pharma a ton of money <laughs> right now, which is why they've poured so much money into research for a fat loss medication because they know that when... They make it since about a third of the adult, I think it's a little higher than a third now at this point, unfortunately, but roughly a third of the adult population in the US is obese and medical terms again. Uh, so that means above 40% body fat percentage, 45% sometimes depends on the categories. And that is a huge, huge opportunity for a lot of money if they make a good weight loss drug, which they did. And they are making tons of money on it. <laughs> However, for you as an individual, when it comes to your health and what you're trying to achieve with your life, your family, your longevity, this med is something that could potentially help you under proper care and um, circumstances. But again, like little is known about how these weekly weight loss injectables can affect your pregnancy and developing babies long term. So even after you give birth to them. So it is very recommended that you stop taking GLP-1 medications two months before trying to get pregnant. It used to be three when my client initially did. However, you can are one of these ozempic baby <laughs> situations where you unexpectedly got fertile and pregnant um, through the use of GLP-1 meds. Just stop immediately once you find out you're pregnant and you can work with a practitioner to get back on the medication to continue your health journey should that be the situation. But I will say it will not always be guaranteed that you will have a perfectly fine pregnancy if your state before the pregnancy was a very high body fat percentage, like we're talking above 45% body fat into the 50s or maybe 60s. If you don't make a lot of headway with some of that fat loss leading into your pregnancy, you will still be at risk of a lot of the complications that typically are on alert for anybody who is pregnant 
above 45% body fat percentage, which that can be anything from preeclampsia to gestational diabetes and all that kind of stuff that absolutely will still be a risk for you. So you do want to make sure that you are communicating openly with your doctor and making sure that you're trying to do as best you can with your lifestyle habits and all of that, mainly your nutrition and such to watch your blood sugar as best you can. um, Because yes, unfortunately, still having a high body fat percentage and carrying a full term pregnancy, you are still very much at risk for blood sugar dysregulation all the way to the extent of getting, you know, gestational diabetes, like I said, and um, a variety of other health complications, just because it is a little bit or a lot of bit tougher on the body to have a pregnancy while being at that excessive body fat percentage, okay? And then that comes with zero judgment attached. That comes with just being well-informed because I have seen it happen. And, you know, it is one of those things that's very hard to prevent when you're in that situation. So if you can prevent it now with being aware that that is a risk, I would highly recommend you be very careful, especially around your ovulation. So track with like a flow, the flow tracking app or any tracking app, natural cycle whatever it is, and make sure you use barrier contraception when you are in that fertile zone while taking your GLP-1. Even if you've struggled with fertility prior to taking this med, especially while taking it, very, very, very important that you take extra precautions with your partner during that very high fertility zone, okay? That is really important that you, you pay attention to that. All right, guys. So I hope that that answered kind of a good amount of what is the main reason these ozempic babies are happening. You know, it's not the GLP-1 just suddenly making you pregnant. (laughs) You are not going to have like immaculate conception from taking a GLP-1. But if you do take a GLP-1 without protection and you are fertile or you are ovulating, unexpectedly, you should be aware that there are potentially higher chances you could get pregnant. So be very aware of that and take the precautions, you know, that you find to be fitting to where you're at in life right now. (laughs) Okay, so I'm going to take a quick moment to answer that question from one of our listeners. And so Allison asked me last week if it's possible to take GLP-1 medications short term and if you can maintain the results after getting off of it. Okay, so this is a really common question, which is why I wanted to answer it on the podcast instead of just to her in my DMs. And again, if you ever have any questions that you want answered on the podcast, shoot them to at Rebel Wellness Podcast on Instagram. But this is a really common question because that's, you know, what everybody wants to know because a lot of people don't want to be on a medication for the rest of their life, especially because it's expensive. You know, it's roughly a grand out of pocket every week. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? Sometimes it's every month. It depends on like how you get it and if your insurance covers more of it or not. So it's always going to land guys on how your lifestyle affects you. So if your lifestyle isn't addressed while taking your GLP-1 medication, you are going to have a really hard time coming off the medication and not just going back to your classic lifestyle treatment of your nutrition and your fitness. Okay. So scientists have said, yes, you can take short term GLP-1 or more, they're looking into microdosing GLP-1s for people who are just looking for some general aid in better body composition. And their standard advice is going to be as long as you are maintaining strength training at least three times a week. So specifically strength training, not just like going and doing a spin class, healthy nutrition habits. So what that sounds like to me is maintain, well, Typically, actually, they do say a higher protein diet. That is something I have seen a lot of the doctors say is maintaining a higher protein diet, good fiber, less starches, less processed foods, low alcohol to no alcohol. You know, those are healthy nutrition habits and walking daily. So on average, that would be 5,000 to 10,000 steps is a really good range for people, especially if you're super sedentary. Those are good lifestyle habits to try to maintain your health, your body fat percentage after weaning down off of a GLP-1. You shouldn't just stop altogether. I've heard, especially because a lot of the um, prescription ones like Ozempic, Manjaro, and all of those are higher doses. You're going to want to work with your doctor to like reduce, reduce, reduce. So that might be 0.25, 0.5, you know, every couple weeks or so until you can get all the way back down to zero. But again, this is newer science. The medication was developed for diabetes. So they wanted people to be on it for the rest of their life. Instead of making lifestyle habit changes, again, I don't agree with that. However, that means that a lot of their protocol does not take into account getting off the med, unfortunately. So it's kind of 
a place where a lot of people are doing more experimental research and like individual person to person from what I've heard from the doctors that I've talked to and all of that. So it is one of those things where like it would probably work best to be monitored by your practitioner as you come off of it. I would say I have heard from a lot of people's firsthand experiences that you don't just want to stop altogether. But what I would add to that general kind of advice is that you need to work through your learned behaviors and put systems in place for yourself for the emotional or stress eating that was possibly taking over your life prior. So your appetite is going to return and it needs to return to your body when you get off one of these meds for healthy longevity because you can't simply enough get enough nourishment to thrive, not just survive. You could survive, but your hair might be crap quality. Your nails will be brittle. Your skin will look gross. You know, you're going to get wrinkly faster, um, saggy your skin faster because you're not producing collagen if you are under eating for the rest of your life. And usually on a GLP-1 med, people eat anywhere from like literally only 500 calories a day to maybe 1200. And as we already know for a standard female adult body, we should never be below 1600 calories. Anything below that is like children's calories, okay? So if you're living on a GLP-1 for multiple years under eating that much, you are going to lose a lot of vitamins and minerals in your energy stores. So you either have to attempt during taking that medication to get those nutrients through high quality supplements. But again, it's a toss up how much your body's actually going to absorb because of your body being slower at digesting. So you'll really need to spend a lot of time those several years after getting off the GLP-1 med to really re-nourish your body and build its mineral stores and vitamin stores back up because you will deplete them when you are taking this med. Okay, so it's really important that you know that your appetite when it comes back That's good, but you have to have habits and systems in place to support longevity at the body fat percentage you are now because you will inevitably just go back to where you were before or worse, even further higher body fat percentage if you don't take care to do that, okay? I know people who are not taking that seriously and are still just eating the way they've always ate, but if you eat the way you always ate, you're going to end up the way you always were, right? So you're going to end back up at that body fat percentage that you spent all this time and money to get off, okay? So yes, you can just gain all that weight back. A lot of people have because they're not taking this part seriously. And this part is easily one of the most important things for you to look into and put time in while you're on the GLP-1 so that you can feel more confident to come off of it. Because ideally, it would be good for you not to be on it the rest of your life. You know, if you're going to take it short term to move a significant amount of body fat, one, two, three max years, then I would highly recommend you get off of it, wean off of it with a protocol. You know, hopefully in a few years, they're going to have even more specific protocols for that. And get yourself, get your butt in, maybe You plan and you budget for a trainer so that you can at least for sure get that system in place to have consistency of at least meeting with a trainer one to two or three times a week, depending on it, or group classes with strength training, you know, build your healthy nutrition habits, make a better budget for pre-prepped meals if you can't make it for yourself or just spend the time to cook better for yourself, learn to make healthy nutrition accessible for yourself, you know, make things taste better, enjoy it more, you know, all that kind of stuff or put systems in place where you are walking daily. You walk after your breakfast every morning or you walk before your breakfast every morning or you walk after your dinner every night, you know, wherever you can fit it in, you know, put those things in your calendar, put them into your lifestyle, make it a habit the same way you made brushing your teeth a habit, the same way you made taking a shower your habit, you know, all of those things in your health need to become habits because you're not going to always be motivated. You need to have discipline and discipline is knowing that if I don't brush my teeth, I'm going to get cavities and then that's going to be a whole pain in the butt or a whole pain in the mouth rather. Same thing goes for your health. Make those things habits, not because you love to do them and you have so much motivation because you want to look like Megan Fox or something like that, but because you actually, for the future you, that's going to thank you for every day that you got up and got your butt out and just let yourself walk, listen to a podcast, listen to a book, work on stuff. If there's like things that you could do while you're walking, you know, walk your dog, Whatever it is, there's a lot of different things that you should put into place as a daily discipline because it's going to pay you 
residuals long term for your health. Okay. So I really encourage you to think about it that way. When you are thinking of using a GLP-1 short term to move body fat to get yourself into a more confident, healthier state potentially, but you have to come off of it with other healthy habits for a long term success. Okay. So I hope that that answered that question for you and it helped you guys listening because that is a really, really, really common thing. And there's a lot of people just trolling around online being like, yeah, but once you get off of it, you just gain it all back. It's not magical like that, but it is magical like that if you don't actually do the work of changing those lifestyle habits that you should have already if you wanted to get a healthier, stronger body. Lean muscle mass is always supportive of long-term success with staying at a better body fat percentage. So you do always need strength training. That is the one thing that differentiated women after liposuction who just gained the fat back or who kept it off is literally just strength training two to three times a week. Strength training specifically, okay? So put that into your lifestyle, find a way to enjoy it and love it. (laughs) You know, get a workout buddy, get a trainer who makes you just do it. Whatever it is, find a way to get strength training into your week uh, and it'll help you tenfold, okay? So, all right, Rebel, that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed this first launch of Hot Take Summer Season 2. So if you really enjoyed this and it was helpful for you, share it on your Instagram, send it to a bestie, whatever, whoever you think needs to hear it. But as always, celebrate your strength and nourishment, walk with confidence, and I'll catch you next week on another episode of Rebel Wellness. Hey Rebel, I just want to say a huge thank you for tuning in and sharing this space with us. Before we sign off, I've got some exciting ways for you to stay connected and to take your wellness journey even further with me. First up, if you haven't already, make sure to swing by coachkales.com and sign up for our newsletter. It's your go-to source for the latest episodes, exclusive content, and a whole lot more wellness goodness delivered straight to your inbox. Check out the show notes for those high quality tips on nutrition, fitness, and just overall well-being. Follow us on Instagram at Rebel Wellness Podcast and my flagship page at Kaylee Loren. We're all about building a community where we can share, inspire, and grow together. So I would love to see you there. Now, if you're looking to reset and realign after a vacation, a hectic work season, or just because you feel like it's time for a healthful cleanse, I've got something super special for you and it's 100% free. Head over to stand.store backslash kales and download my free realignment detox guide. You can also find it at coachkale.com in the freebies section. I'm sharing my unique holistic approach to help you cut back inflammation, improve your skin, and even shed some excess weight with this guide. So trust me, you're gonna love it. Go download it for free now. But last but not certainly least, if you've got a burning health question you'd like answered on the show, or if you're curious about my one-on-one remote coaching or group courses, don't hesitate to visit my website and reach out to me there or hello at kayleelauren.com is my best email for contacting me. I am here to support you on your journey to wellness, so do not feel afraid to reach out. All right, Rebel, catch you on the next episode.